Okay. Okay. Welcome everyone to the ALG Featured Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us, or if you are watching the recording, thank you for watching. Today we're going to be hearing from Jean Mangan at the University of Georgia School of Law on the Legal Writing Manual. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. If you are ready, the floor is yours. All right. Hello, welcome everyone. I can see the people in the chat and I know most of them. So that makes me feel better. Um, for those of you who may be watching this and don't know me or watching it recorded, my name is Jean Mangan and I teach at the UGA School of Law. And I'm gonna talk to you guys about my legal writing manual, the second edition that I did through the Affordable Learning Continuous Improvement Grant. So real quick, here's me, here's my title, here's where I work. Um, I don't have my camera on because one max and teams don't work well together. And also I'm actually sitting on the floor of a fitness center at a hotel. So um, this is what I look like. I also am always this excited when I talk. Okay, so I have been teaching legal writing since August of 2018. So I'm still new. And I wanna make sure like as I'm moving forward through this presentation, I'm gonna talk about openeducationalresource.oer and I will be really enthusiastic about my way, but I recognize that my way of pursuing this is not the only way. I just want to give you guys a vision or a way to look at doing this. And I, but up front, I want to acknowledge there are plenty of other ways to use OER or create OER rather than how I did it. Although I like how I did it. So, okay. First things first, why did I even start creating OER resources? Well, it first started not with how I had no idea what open educational resource was. I was just feeling like a commercial textbook cost way too much. The first year that I taught the textbook that I was using was $120. Um, and I also felt like we weren't using a huge percentage of that book in class or um, the percentage that we did. I was finding that I was saying, okay, we're going to do what paragraphs one and three say, but ignore paragraph two. And I thought to myself, as a student, I would be really frustrated if I were spending $120 on a book that we're not even using, or the teacher is saying disregard parts of it, or it just felt like it wasn't fair to the students. And legal writing is a required class for law students. And I, I use this book for the first year law students. So they're brand new to law school. They all think they're excellent writers. And I have a lot of hurdles to overcome anyway to convince students to consider my way of doing legal writing. And I thought this textbook is creating an unnecessary barrier towards students buying into what the class is teaching. And because it's a required class and because it was so important that we develop a rapport, I wanted to see, is there a way that I can fix this? And so the first thing that I did was to create a course packet. Um, I call it my preliminary efforts. So what I did is I read through legal writing textbooks. I read through probably 20 different ones and I pulled the chapters that I liked the best. I also used some online resources um, and I went to our local print place in Athens that does course packets and asked them to go ahead and get me the copyright permissions and all that kind of stuff. And so we put together this packet and it was, it was great. It was definitely more targeted. I knew why each reading was in there. I had selected it on purpose. It most closely matched what I wanted, um, but it still wasn't exactly the way that I was teaching because we all as faculty teach in our own unique ways. And the cost of it was still, I mean, $63.86 was how much it cost, but this only covered the first semester. So, I had this goal of not spending as having the students spend as much on the book, but cost wise, it was going to come out about the same. Um, so I was kind of like, okay, well, what do I do? I need to, you know, copyright is something that's important. I don't want to take other people's work. There's a lot of value in the work that people have put together and put in commercial textbooks. Um, but 
one of my priorities as an instructor was to lower every hurdle possible to increase diversity in the legal profession. And one of those places is cost. So while I was wrestling with all of this, um, I had a student who I actually worked with in a different capacity. Before I started teaching legal writing, I was a staff attorney for the Wild Bank Child Endangerment and Sexual Exploitation Clinic at the law school. And so a student that I had worked with there was also in an upper level class with me. And he asked me if I happened to be hiring a TA. Um, he said, you know, I'm gonna graduate next semester and um, I, I, I need funding, <laughs> I need something. So I didn't have a, a budget to do that, but I went around searching and I actually ended up talking to Stephen Wolfson, who is one of the law librarians at the law school. And he told me about this magical thing called open educational resources. And I thought, this is awesome. And he was like, and you know, there's, there's a grant right now, actually. And I first found out about it um, this way. And so the grant that I used for the first edition was through UGA's office, um, the, the vice provost. And this first edition I created with Chase um, and with Gabrielle Gravel, and I liked it. Um, but one of the other things that Stephen had cautioned me and that I was seeing about OER when I did all this research online about how the heck do I do this is take it small. So my first takeaway I wanna to give to everyone who is thinking about creating your own OER resources or adapting or adopting someone else's OER resources is give yourself permission not to get it right on the first time or the second time or the third time. Um, and so with this first edition, my big goal was just to get the text. I didn't have any examples. Um, it's actually a 126 page PDF. It's all in Times New Roman 14 point font. Um, I had designed it so you could download each chapter to stand alone, but that meant there were no cross references between the chapters and there were no numbers. Um, and the reason for picking the formatting that I did is I was thinking I want my audience to be able to pick this apart as quickly as they can, but I failed to acknowledge that my primary audience was going to be students um, and they had difficulty with this format because they, it didn't look like a book, it didn't feel like a book, and it was really hard to navigate. Um, again, I mentioned I have student co-authors and I really wanna shout out to them, this is something that I've also made really important to my work in the OER space, is to always be bringing students in to help me write. Again, this is a choice I make, not everyone wants to do that, but I think that having students involved means that I get over that problem that so many faculty have, which is I'm, I'm an expert at this point, and sometimes I forget what it's like to be new. And so I was really fortunate that both Chase and Gabby were able to work with me on this first edition and pr provide research, resources and research. But more importantly, I sent them the draft and I said, okay, does this make sense? And they would be able to be like, mm, no, actually this does not help at all. Um, and Gabby actually came in after she had just taken my class. And so she was able to provide feedback as a student of your class, the book is helpful here, but it's not helpful here. So, and Gabby used the packet. So, I'm sitting here and I'm going, okay, I started small. I've got my first edition. I'm already seeing that there are issues with it. Um, I still like it because we're all on the same page in terms of vocabulary, but I, um, I, it needs more work. And this is when I found out about Affordable Learning Georgia. I feel like most of my OER journey is just stumbling into excellent resources because they just come in at a fortuitous or serendipitous moment. And so, when I found out about ALG and what they were asking for, I was like, this is awesome. So knowing I needed to improve, um, I was using it, but what I also did while I was looking for more grant funding to write the second edition was I actually gave my class that year a series of Qualtrics surveys for each chapter. And it was the same questions each time. It was essentially what worked, what didn't, what would you like to see changed? Uh, they were anonymous, students would, I never got 100% participation. Um, typically, if they didn't like the chapter, I'd get more feedback on something that was bad. 
Um, but it was really nice to collect that data from the students using the text so I could decide how to improve it. Um, and then, of course, using the materials for the school year let me see where there were errors. And I talked about a couple of those before. So ALG Continuous Improvement Grant. Again, recognizing there's probably a mix of audience and who's taking in this presentation or this recording. Um, ALG, Affordable Learning Georgia, offers two types of grants. They have a textbook transformation grant, which is for doing a whole new thing, which is essentially what I did with my first edition. But they also offer these excellent continuous improvement grants. And what they allow for, I just pulled this from their website, but they let for that revision of OER, creation of ancillaries, or to replace current OER with new and improved. And honestly, I would wanted to do all three of those things. So I submitted for this grant and waited with bated breath and I got it. It was so exciting. Um, but of course, with a new grant and a new funding agency, there ended up being some new variables that I had to, to keep in mind. So rather than using the PDF as the final deliverable, ALG has a platform, an online platform to host your resources that's called Manifold. And I will tell you, I'm still intimidated by talking about online hosting anything. So if I use these words wrong, this is me, not anyone who tried to train me. Um, but it, it, so it was something I wanted, I wanted to use, but I had to figure out how to use. Tiffany would guided me every step of the way on how to do this. So if you're thinking about doing this, but you're feeling intimidated by online, Affordable Learning Georgia has folks that are willing, able, and nice when they help. Um, something else that was a new thing for me with the second edition and getting the grant for continuous improvement is they've added that everything had to be completely accessible. And I hadn't really considered before what, what that meant. I mean, when I was thinking accessible, I was thinking in terms of cost. I was thinking in terms of paywalls. But I was able to learn through the kickoff meeting and through the training and the handouts, the materials that were provided by ALG. Accessibility is more than that. It's recognizing not every student can arrive to encounter a textbook in the way that we consider to be the way, main way you consume it, which is you hold it in your hands and you use your eyes to read it. So one of the big things that was new about the second edition for me is that the product I created had to be able to also be in a Microsoft Word document that could be accessible for those who have vision impairments so they could use their screen readers in order to read the text. And what that meant was I had to make sure I used the Microsoft Word formatting for different headings and things, but I also had to think about, okay, if I insert a table that looks great, but is the reader, the screen reader, going to be able to read that table in the way that I'm intending the audience to take it in? And the answer was no. So there were a lot of things that I had to think about and redesign. The content was fine, but I had to think about how I presented it. And what I found through doing this was not only does this help folks who need to use a screen reader, but there's plenty of people who prefer to use a screen reader, it just as a matter of preference. And the more I got into learning about accessibility, the more I thought, you know, if my goal is to reduce barriers and obstacles to access, then yes, in addition to cost, I absolutely need to be thinking about including not just um, a neurotypical student, um, but also people with neurodivergencies, people with learning and vision and other developmental, I hate that deficit model, but deficit uh, delays and that kind of thing. Because if we wanna have a diverse profession, that, that means more than just the people who can afford to go. It means people with all kinds of different thinking. Um, the other things were I wanted to add in graphics, but I had to figure out how to do that and make it accessible. And then I needed to add an example. So the biggest thing I got from students was they did not like that there were no examples. That was not okay. So I needed to come up with a whole series of examples for the book um, that students could use. And so what I had, I designed the, the, the book to be uh, starting from the beginning of law school through creating a memo and then a brief. Um, and so I took, we decided to create a series of examples starting with raw cases, just go read this case and then show how could that case get annotated? How could it be brief? Use those same cases for rule synthesis, case synthesis. 
So essentially, we created a case study for this. Um, and I really liked the results. Um, but before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about the process. So one of the things, I've been like throwing all these different things out at you. How did I keep up with all of this? And so this was something that I struggled with when I was first starting on this journey of how do I write a book with a, co with, with a colleague, with a student co-author, and also maintain my teaching load and not lose track of what the heck I'm doing. And so what Brittany and I did is we had a shared Google Doc. And I've just taken some screenshots of what we did. We would give lists of what I needed to do, what she needed to do. We would write notes to each other. We would, um, we essentially had a very, very long text thread through Google Docs, but it was able to update us as we went. And, and I built on this process from the first edition where when Chase was doing research for me, um, he would scan everything in and upload it to a Google Drive folder. And so we could share it that way rather than having to do hard copy. And then we finally got to using a Google Doc. So not very high tech, but it worked really well for us. And it's the process that I, I keep using. Okay, so here is the cover of the Legal Writing Manual second edition. Um, I also, so I want to just kind of note, I know on the title, it doesn't have the, the page, excuse me, on the cover page, it doesn't have the edition number and it doesn't have my student co-authors. Honestly, this was for budgetary reasons. I paid a graphic designer out of my own pocket to make this and I wanted to be able to keep using it and I knew I wanted to keep updating it. Um, so I know that that's kind of not in line, but that's what we have. I just think it helps, again, to create that initial buy-in when you encounter it of, oh, this has been designed to teach rather than just like a cover page that looks like someone typed it on their computer, which is what I did with the first edition. Okay. Two student co-authors, I had Brittany Goad and Connelly Doise. Brittany is the one who wrote all of the examples with me and also helped me comb through the Qualtrics survey data. And we decided what what's a trend versus what is a one-off. And Connelly did the graphic design for everything that's inside the book. So it's really neat. I mean, these were the students that I encountered from teaching them in class, and we were able to connect over an interest in, in creating more access to legal education in different ways. Connolly also expressed that she had an interest in developing a design portfolio because she's, she's a very talented artist. So what I also love about doing these OER textbooks, particularly through these grants, is I'm able to pay students for them to try out something that they are excited about. And I also give them a line on their resume. We get a great resource out of it. And I get to see my students more as whole people rather than just names on a list. And I think that that is really, really cool. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is actually show you guys a quick video, minute and 36 seconds of what does this book look like on Manifold? So hopefully this is good, yeah, okay. So this is the opening page when you go in, you can scroll down, you'll see table of contents. Each of these is linked to, it will take you to the chapter if you click on them. In addition to the chapters, you also have the appendices. So these are the things I attached on. These are all the different resources for examples. Now, if you want to just start reading it, you click here, and this is what it takes you to. This is the first page. You'll see my shout out to my folks I worked with so far. Um, if you go in the top left, there's a table of contents. This is another way to navigate through the book. Um, I also wrote this chapter of how to use this book because I wanted people to actually look at it. Here are the beautiful, beautiful, oh wait, I have to pause. I'm, I just, they're so beautiful. Connolly made these excellent, excellent graphics. And so this one that I paused on right here, this is the entire year's worth of writing summarized in one graphic. I will tell you, this is really challenging for me to even conceive of, and Connolly worked very patiently with me on how to make this. But here's kind of my next plug for why doing OER is helpful beyond just saving folks money, is going through this process of writing this book and putting together this graphic made me really have to think about why am I teaching each thing? How does it connect? What are my learning objectives? And so 
writing this book really has helped me hone my why for each thing we do in class. So also we do a lot of building. So we have a summary of law that builds to a memo, um, objective writing, we switch over to persuasive writing. Okay, so then you can just next chapter. Oh, I didn't do that, good, I just scrolled down. Oh, right, okay, so what we're gonna do now is look at the last chapter, parts of appellate brief, because this also shows another neat part of Manifold, um, which is, this chapter is really long. So this is one of the downsides, I think, to the screen, to, to being online, is it, it's long, but we scroll down. Eventually, we're gonna get to Word documents that are actually linked in the chapter that students can access right then. So in this parts of appellate brief, they're having to write all these different components, but they need to make a title page. Well, I have a doc embedded in there. They're just manual to fill in, but it gives them an idea about where to start. So they're not spending their time um, fighting with Word and instead are able to spend time focusing on the learning outcomes that I want them to do. So this is the second edition that I was able to create with the affordable learning grant that I got for round 19. Um, no, keep going. So just wanted to kind of say, once you start, you just can't stop. It's like Pringles. Um, I actually have also been able to get a grant from Affordable Learning Georgia to do a legal excerpt textbook. And that one was written very differently. I just took a lot of, it was case law. Case law is all public domain, but textbooks for law school, again, are super expensive. So Gabe Doster worked with me on this. He's the one on the left in order to, as a student who took my class, he reviewed everything I put together and made sure it made sense. Right now, I'm working on creating the annotated examples. Again, that building piece by piece. Naz Ali is working with me on that. Um, and we're going around the state of Georgia pulling criminal law documents that have actually been filed in courts and we're gonna annotate those for students to see. Um, and my next steps, I fortunately just received another Affordable Learning Georgia grant. I'm gonna work on the third edition for legal writing. Um, Max Maseko, who took me last year at the current 2L, and he is working on the next set of examples. Um, he actually has to write a full brief for this. So shout out to Max for his enthusiasm with full examples. And then um, Dylan Cohen, who is a current student of mine right now, is gonna work with me on really updating the persuasive writing and parts of appellate brief chapter. Another kind of practice tip I'd say is that so often when we work on projects, we wanna start at the beginning and go to the end. But I was finding that I was never saving enough time for that persuasive writing piece, which is the second semester in the book. So this time with this ALG grant, I chose to focus on that second semester worth of materials in an effort to get them to be really more kind of where I want them to be. Um, so with that, it's me, I'm Jean Mangan, here's my email. I love talking about OER, it's one of my favorite topics. Um, and I think it's super duper awesome in lots and lots of ways. So that's how I put together the second edition and where I'm going here. Oh, oh, I'm supposed to tell you about implementation results. Y'all, once everyone is on the same vocabulary page, we're like, we're all talking about the same legal writing paradigm, or we're all talking about a question presented in the same way. It has reduced the miscommunication for the fundamental basics. So we really aren't spending a lot of time agreeing on terms. And instead we're able to start diving into the whys and the hows and the applications. So I will say another thing that has been a benefit that I've seen just from a, a classroom pedagogy standpoint has been we are able to all be on the same page and have conversations about what we're doing quickly, um, more so than we were before. And I will say that since I've implemented my textbook, I have seen all of my students every year master the organization that is needed for legal writing, which is honestly the most important part and sometimes the hardest part to get. Um, so I would say implementation wise, this has been really successful for me. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> Um, and it's actually really cool the, that that last part that you uh, were talking about with uh, classroom changes. It's really great to hear about um, how this affects that sort of different kind of classroom that is the law classroom, um, because we haven't heard from that. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's really great to hear that things are working well uh, in your classroom with your textbook and uh, that you are going to continue on that path. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. 
feel free to uh, use your mic or use the chat. Um, and I apologize if you hear thunder in the background. <laughs> We have in the chat um, from Rami Haddad. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation and best of luck with your third edition. Thank you. <laughs> um. So, I guess we're. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I the audience, I kind of packed the audience with people. Um, but you'll see you, two of my student co-authors are actually here, both Chase Lindale and Max and Seiko. Um, you'll also see Stephen Wolfson is here. He was the he is still my my OER go to and he's wonderful. Um, and and then Megan Flanagan is a peer reviewer who has had to read multiple editions of this thing. She's a practicing attorney, but she always is willing to come in and look at what I've written and be like, yes, this is still useful. Thank you. Um, oh, and Marianne Samuel's here. And she and I have gotten to talk about how much I love OER and she's seen my obsessive excitement with it. So this is cool. So basically, hi everyone. That's awesome. And and I am I am very sure that we will also have a lot of people watching the video um, because uh, we have quite a few people who actually go back and watch all of the videos after they happen instead of attending live. Um, and so you may end up with uh, some questions or um, some email discussions uh, later on as well. Yeah, and so Tiffany, I when I say that I love talking about this and I'm happy to talk with folks, I really, really am. Um, actually, I think, so James McNiff, who's on, I'm trying to talk him into doing an OER for his class. Um, and I, I'm happy to talk with anyone about my idea, how, how I went through it. But also, if you have things you think that maybe I could improve on working forward, um, or if you've done something really cool that you think maybe would be beneficial for me to incorporate, I'd also love to hear from folks about that. Like, I always am looking for what worked, what didn't, and how can I improve next time? Because ideally, there's always going to be a next time. Yeah, absolutely. And if I, you know, if I think of things, I'm, I definitely try to reach out to people when I'm uh, thinking of things that might benefit their projects. We've got some more, uh, some more thank yous and awesome works kinds of comments. Well, um, oh, do we have? Did you have any uh, questions, Marianne? I hear your microphone. Yeah. Uh, Marianne, you uh, unmuted your mic. Do you, did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, it was, was accidental. Um, I love this presentation so much because I appreciated how you talked about access being broader than just the financial aspect uh, in terms of accessibility for like under ADA, for example. And, um, you know, just the broader perspective is, is really nice to hear because most of, you know, the concern is generally around the dollar figure. So it's refreshing to hear more than just that. Thank you. Yeah, I the more I learn about education, I feel like I'm an accidental professor, the more I just realize there's so many layers out there to think about. And um, right now I'm really big on getting everyone who wants to be at the table to the table. Yeah, I, I think so that, you know, we're, we're called Affordable Learning Georgia. And so Obviously, our sort of first order of business is that affordability aspect, but we have been um, really trying to increase the accessibility and, uh, you know, uh, applying the beautiful things about affordability and openness to how they can affect the classroom, like, pedagogically. And so it's really exciting to you know, hear about projects that are doing that and 
to continue funding projects that do that. So, and this is one and, of those ones. And Tiffany, to kind of go off of that, OER can often be a great starting point for, for just open pedagogy or pedagogy. And that's something that I'm trying to explore more. Um, I think I have my first test case. I actually had a student who really valued a reading I did in the upper level class. And the rest of the class was like, we didn't want to read that 30 pages. So I've asked the student if she just wants to work with me to write a chapter for this book that will be to synthesize that material. Um, and it's just, hey, do you want to do this? And she is really excited. And so it's neat to be able to work with her. She wants to refine her editing skills because she's on a journal. And so we're going to work on a how do you revise and edit other work chapter um, in order to benefit future classes, but also so she can develop her skills. That's awesome. That's awesome, and I, I'm I'm excited to see it see see the results of that. Do we have any other thoughts or questions? We have a couple people typing in the chat. Well, so while kind of seeing if someone has something to put in the chat, I also just want to give a shout out to Affordable Learning Georgia and for how they've been working on the process for applying for grants. Um, with each round, there has been an improvement in the efficiency and the flow of how to apply for and get the grant and the ease of accessing information. And it's really neat for me to see an iterative process being used for a grant agency who is itself trying to encourage people to be iterative in their work and um, I would just also say again if you're thinking about applying but you're a little nervous Tiffany and Jeff are both super kind and helpful and if they can walk me through how to use the internet I promise you they can help you too we are always available um, so yes definitely reach out um, and thank you um, we are we try every round to make things a little easier so um, we actually just added something uh, that will hopefully uh, improve future rounds, uh, assuming that we continue with funding. Um, and the that is a, a a decision tool that will help teams make decisions on which type of grant they should be applying for. So uh, hopefully that will be our next improvement on the uh, proposal process. Uh Something, well, never mind. I won't go into my advocacy role yet. Maybe I will. So, if you're ever, if you're thinking about OER also, and maybe you have any kind of like administrative concerns, right now, I don't know how institutions are considering whether this counts for teaching, scholarship, or service, but definitely check with your department head or your dean um, about how it can be considered and just be open to trying it even if it doesn't quite fit in because there are so many intangible benefits, even if it doesn't really check off a box for your teaching and stuff. And I'm totally okay if we just hang up before one, my feelings will not be hurt. I just realized I was just talking without my mic on. Um, yeah, I was gonna just just about to say that if uh, if we don't have any other questions or comments, that we can go ahead and wrap up. But if you have anything else that you wanted to close out with, um, please feel free to do so. Okay. All right. Um, Let's go ahead and end the recording then. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll stop the recording now.